Okay, so normally this is where I would have you open up your Bibles and turn to our, our scripture this morning, but we're not going to do that. Uh, we've got a lot of scripture we're going to look at. I don't have just one for us this morning. When you're tackling a topic such as the Holy Spirit, you can't just really turn to one thing. Just like if I was teaching on God the Father or Christ the Son, you can't just turn to one text. And so we're going to be looking at a lot of text this morning, which I know is quite different than our normal exp uh, expositional preaching that we do. Uh, this is more of a topical thing. Um, but we, we learned, if you remember, two weeks ago, as we opened up this new study, this new sermon series together of walking in the Spirit, the first things that we are to do, that Scripture teaches us throughout Scripture, it's the thread that's woven, uh, that when we are um, waiting uh, and lear or learning to walk in the Spirit, the first two things that we must do, uh, no matter what situation arises, no matter where the Lord is leading us, does anyone remember those two principles that we need to do when, when, whenever we're waiting to be led of the Spirit? You can shout them out. Well, wait is one. What was the other one? Worship. I heard it out there. So scripture is very clear. Uh, to we are to worship the Lord first. Worship the Lord first. Wait upon the Lord. And then wait for him to speak to us and lead us and guide us. But my question is this morning, what are we waiting for, right? When we have the topic of the Holy Spirit, what are we waiting for? How many of you, if I asked you right now on the spot, could define the work of the Holy Spirit? You could say, you know what, this is the work, biblically, the work of the Holy Spirit, X, Y, and Z. I wonder how many of us could define all those things. I know many of us probably could define some of those things, but as I began to prepare this sermon and, and actually move forward, I was going to preach, preach on walking in the flesh versus walking in the Spirit. But before we even can do that, I think it is vitally important, church, vitally important that we define the work of the Holy Spirit first. What are we waiting for? You know, as we're waiting for the Spirit to lead us, what is it that the Spirit is going to do in the life of a believer? We have to look at that. And so that is what God's Word is going to teach us today. Now, I'll say this up front. Right, right now, there is much confusion within the church as to what the work of the Holy Spirit is. Much confusion. You go to one church, maybe one denomination, they'll teach you one thing. You go to another church, another denomination, they'll teach you another thing. This morning, I don't want to teach you from my experience. I don't want to teach you from your experience. I want to teach you from this book. Because this book holds the truths, the authoritative truth on the work of the Spirit, just like it holds the authoritative truth on the work of the Son, the work of the Father, and everything in between. How many of you believe that this is our only source of authority in this life? Every one of us, I, I, I hope. So when we're defining the work of the Holy Spirit, church, this morning I want to have you think about what you know about the Holy Spirit, and I want you to set it aside. Because much, or maybe not much, but maybe some of what you think is the work of the Holy Spirit is not the work of the Holy Spirit at all. And we'll talk about that, and I'll define that in a moment. Because there's no question that we live in a religious culture. We don't live in a Christian culture. Even our churches, I wouldn't even say all of them, maybe perhaps most of them are even Christian. And really what's happened, probably really over the course of the past 100 years, is a lot of things have been attributed to the work of the Holy Spirit that in no way, shape, or form are found anywhere in here, are no way, shape, and form found anywhere throughout the annals of church history, are nowhere found anywhere in the writings of the apostolic age. And yet, around the turn of the, the 20th century, early 1900s, uh, a lot of things were attributed to the work of the Holy Spirit that weren't. What I'm going to do this morning, I'm going to point out two of those false thinkings, those false ideolo ideologies this morning, and we are going to point those out, but then we're going to go into the, what the Scripture lists as the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, my guess is probably every one of us here have been influenced in some way, shape, or form by what somebody has thought up, what somebody has told you about the work of the Holy Spirit. And I want to set that straight this morning because, because like I said, about 100 years ago, a movement began within the church. It's called the charismatic movement. Many of us have probably heard that term before. And I'm not saying everything that came out of that movement was bad, but there was a lot of stuff attributed to the Holy Spirit in that movement that is absolutely categorically unbiblical and false. And I want to set that straight this morning before we can move on. And like I said, many of us have probably been influenced by that movement in one way or another. I knew I grew up in charismatic churches, and I know some of you did as well. So today, without even realizing it, and this is the problem, church, without even realizing it, there are generations of Christians that attribute certain things as the work of the Holy Spirit that are not. 
that are not listed anywhere in, this, in the Word of God, and yet we just believe it because somebody thought it up and told us and it was handed down to us. We're not going to rely on what somebody told us anymore. There's a, there's a song that I listen to. It's actually a Christian rap song, and it starts out with this. Uh, it says, forget about what somebody told you, about what you thought, or what somebody made up, and let's look at the right way to know the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And the whole, the whole uh, song is about the Holy Spirit and defining the work of the Spirit through God's Word, not through our imaginations. And that is what we're going to talk about this morning. So what I want us again to do, and I said this once before, but it's so important, let's set aside what we think we know. Can we do that for a moment? And let's just look at our only source of authority this morning. Our only source of authority, and it's this. Now, this sermon might challenge what some of us have come to believe about the Holy Spirit, and that's good. This sermon might open up some dialogue, which is good. But let's look at Scripture together. Before we do that, though, I want to tell you, it, to point two things out that are absolutely not the work of the Spirit, that the, that, this, that the charismatic movement has attributed to the Spirit. And I point those two things out first. And again, I don't have to tell you all the things that are false, I really just have to teach you the truth, right? And then you'll be able to recognize what is false. I say this all the time, but if I teach you what 2 plus 2 is, it equals 4, you'll be able to recognize that any other answer is false. And that's what we're going to do this morning. So I'm not going to spend a ton of time telling you what is not true. I'm going to spend most of our telling, the time telling you what is true. But I want to point two things out this morning that have come out of the charismatic movement that are categorically false, unscriptural, unbiblical, that have been attributed to the work of the Spirit. And you can write these down. I didn't put uh, this in your bulletins this morning because there just wasn't room. We're, we're going to be covering so much stuff. One thing that is often taught in the charismatic movement is that the Holy Spirit is continuing revelation. He is continuing to speak truths, extra biblical truths that we must follow. That is categorically false and heresy. I'm going to say that right up front right now. It's a very popular belief in the charismatic movement, not all charismatic churches, but many. The idea that if we listen hard enough, that if we press into the Spirit hard enough, God will reveal new truths to us in order to follow them. Every false religion, by the way, that has ever been started, every sect of Christianity has been started that way. Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, Seventh-day Adventists, and even the charismatic movement was started on that principle that God had given new divine revelation, and that new divine revelation took precedence over this book. Never, ever will the Holy Spirit work in that way. So if you think that that's the way the Holy Spirit works, church, you are, um, you're just wrong. You're, you've misunderstood, uh, and we need to turn to God's word. The Holy Spirit is not going to continue writing this book, and he's not going to tell you something that he hasn't told the apostles 2,000 years ago to write here. How many of you agree with that and understand that? There's no continuing revelation. One of the mantras of the charismatic movement is this, and how many of you have heard this? God told me. How many of you have heard someone say, God told me? Listen, church, if it's not here, God didn't tell you anything. It's a figment of your imagination most of the time. And we're going to talk about that, and I'm going to define that in a moment. For some reason in the charismatic movement, many people believe that God has, gives these strange new revelations of truths specifically to them. That's not how God works, church. It's not how the Holy Spirit works. The Holy Spirit doesn't do that. He doesn't give a revelation to one person 2,000 years after he's closed the revelation of this book. And I want to define this a little bit uh, more uh, clearly for you. How many of you have ever heard someone say to you, God told me to tell you X, Y, and Z was going to happen in your life? And that, then that thing never happened. How many of you have had that, ever had anyone tell you that before? I'll raise both hands because it's happened to me several times. John, God told me X, Y, and Z was going to happen in your life concerning this certain situation, and that thing didn't happen. Brothers and sisters, Jesus refers to the Holy Spirit as what? The Spirit of truth. All through the book of John, the Spirit of truth. If somebody ever tells you, the Holy Spirit told me, that, or God told me to tell you X, Y, and Z was going to happen in your life, and it doesn't happen... That is what is known as blasphemy, church. Blasphemy. False prophet. If you want to read about false prophets and what God thinks about false prophets, read Ezekiel 13 this week, church. It is not good. And so what I want to warn you against is if anyone ever comes up to you and say, God told me to tell you this is going to happen in your life, 
probably stop that person before they get themselves into trouble. That's probably the most loving thing you could do. Now, I'm not saying that God doesn't reveal truths to us, but brothers and sisters, it will always line up with this book. Just this week, uh, Anna told me I could share the story. Anna, we were here for prayer time on Thursday, and Anna said that the Lord, as she was uh, worshiping the Lord, she had this vision of the, 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 the army of God standing behind Jesus Christ, and we were getting ready to move in a direction. But that direction wasn't fully uh, realized until we all dropped to our knees and surrendered to Christ, and then Christ led us. That is not a weird, strange prophecy, church. That would line up with what the Word of God teaches us, right? That we are to surrender our lives to Christ first, we, that, God, that Christ is made perfect in our weakness and surrender. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about uh, biblical truths that are given uh, that way. What I'm talking about, church, is if somebody tells you the future of X, Y, or Z is going to happen in your life and it does not come true, that is false. That is a false prophet. That is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit because what you're doing is you're saying the Holy Spirit told you something that is a lie. And so the charismatic movement, at least the charismatic churches I grew up in, that happened almost weekly. Almost weekly. Somebody would say, God told me. And then that thing that God told them, that God supposedly told them, never happened. So I want to be clear there, church. The Spirit is a spirit of truth. Okay? The Spirit of God is the Spirit of truth. He will never tell you something that doesn't line up with what is already written or that does not come to pass. Okay, That is so important because what has happened over the past 100 years is we've taken that phrase, that mantra, God told me, and we've given people a pass. Who am I to tell you what God has told you? Who am I to, to interject into that? That's what we say, and we give it a pass. That is wrong, church. Who am I? Who are you? You are children of God and you know the truth of God's word. So if somebody tells you something that is categorically false, you can absolutely stand on the authority of this and tell them, no, what you're saying is not true. Because it would be here if it was. And I want to tell us this morning, church, revelation, revelation, divine revelation has ceased. It is done. Scripture tells us that in several places. This book has been written. Ephesians chapter 2, among other places, talks about the apostles and the prophets have laid the foundation of the word of God. And here it is. It's written. It's right there. Run from anyone who says otherwise. Run from anyone who says otherwise. Like I said, every false religion, every one of them has been started by Divine revelation, new divine revelation. God told me that this thing is more important. Even though it's not in his word, he's told me it's more important and that's the direction we're going to go. And the perversion of God's word that this divine revelation has produced over the past 100 years has been tragic, church. Out of this movement has spawned a gospel that is no gospel at all, which is the life enhancement gospel. That is spawned out of this movement. The life enhancement gospel. Come to Jesus who give you love, joy, peace, lasting happiness. You go to heaven when you die, which is a categorically false gospel. The other thing that has come out of this is the name it and claim it movement. If we speak loud enough, if we speak uh, the right words in the right order, perhaps, that we can change and move God off of his will. That is, again, not the work of the Spirit, church. That is not the work of the Spirit. Uh, if you, so I want to be clear. If someone tells you they have heard a word from God, this is how you test it, church. This is how you test it. In, in, in the Old Testament scriptures, specifically with the speaking of the prophets, read through the prophets, the prophets will tell you this is how you test it. Two ways to test if, it, if it's God's word or not. Number one, does it come true? If it doesn't, it's not God's word. Never was. It was a figment of someone's imagination. It was their sensationalism. It was their emotionalism. Number two, the best way you can know if something was God's word is if somebody says, God spoke to me, Joel, and this is what he said. Read it word for word. Okay? Then you know for sure that somebody's telling you the truth. But if somebody comes up to you and tells you, God told me X, Y, or Z, and it doesn't happen, church, that is heresy, it is blasphemy, and it is a false prophet. And we need to be mindful of that, and we need to be, we need to be ready to call that for what it is. We've given it a pass for too long in this country, in this religious society. We are not to bear a false witness at all, let alone against the Holy Spirit, church. Let alone against the Holy Spirit. And like I said, I have had many times in my life where somebody told me the Lord showed them something and that thing never came to pass. 
The Holy Spirit does not lie. The Holy Spirit does not lie. So that's the first thing I want to point us out right up front. The Holy Spirit will not lie to you. Revelation has ceased. The second thing, and this of course stems out of the charismatic movement, is the idea, and hear me out, because I know some of us have grown up in churches where this took place, and I was one of them, where the Holy Spirit will knock you off your feet and you'll start laughing uncontrollably or barking like a dog or mooing like a cow or fill in the blank, falling into some trance, convulsing on the floor. Brothers and sisters, this type of thing, I think it's referred to most churches as slain in the spirit, is not recorded one time in this book. It is not recorded one time in the annals of church history. It is not recorded one time in any extra biblical writing out of the ap apostolic age. Nowhere. The first time it exists anywhere in Christianity is around the turn of the century, in the 20th century, in the early 1900s first time it ever exists anywhere in the Christian faith. This idea that the work of the Spirit will make you bark like a dog is ridiculous, church, and we need to call it for what it is. That is not the work of the Spirit. The Bible doesn't define that in any way, shape, or form at all. Like I said, I grew up in churches where this was fairly common. I've even seen TV preachers get a Holy Ghost machine gun and blow people to the ground. Or blow on them and they all fall over in a hysteria. Church, nowhere in Scripture does the Bible say that is the work of the Spirit. You will not find one place. And like I said, you will not find one writing. I, I actually uh, did a study this week on somebody who is much brighter than I, who has done a historical, uh, historical um, uh, search of this type of behavior in the church. It did not exist until the 20th century in the church. However, guess where it did exist, church? Two places, pagan religions and satanic religions. Two places it existed before that. Two places it existed before that, but never in Christian history. And what I have found is that many people who are f the, the furthest away from sound theological doctrinal truths of this book are most susceptible to fall into this type of behavior. And like I said, this doesn't exist anywhere in the Word of God, and I want to set the record straight. And I know it might ruffle some feathers this morning, but I, it, it, it took me a long time to come to this conclusion as well. But I'll say this, church, laughing uncontrollably and hee-hawing on the ground is not a work of the Spirit. It does not exist in God's Word. It doesn't. It doesn't. And I can say that with absolute authority because I've read this and studied this. And we have simply allowed many people to tell us what the work of the Spirit is with no scriptural proof whatsoever. And I'm going to say this this morning. How many of us, let's say somebody came up to us and told us that the work of the Son um, or, or that Jesus Christ specifically was not the Son of God. How many of us would object to that and stand up for the Son of God? We would. We'd stand up to that. How many, if somebody told us God was not the creator of the universe, would stand up, we would object to that, right? We would have an answer for that. Yet when people tell us that the work of the Spirit is barking like a dog on the ground, many people say nothing. We give it a pass. We give it a pass. Church, we have to stand up for the honor of the third person of the Trinity. And that's part of what we're going to discuss this morning. We're going to look at God's word, biblically define, biblically define the work of the Spirit, not out of sensationalism or emotionalism at best. Actually, I think at worst, probably uh, demonic. In Matthew 12, 30 through 32, I'm not sure if I put this up on the screen or not. I don't believe I did. But Matthew 12, 32, 32, 32 says this. Jesus is speaking. He says, He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. Therefore I say to you, any sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven by pe uh, forgiven people. But blasphemy against the Holy Spirit shall not be forgiven. Whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, it shall be give forgiven of him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the age to come. And so church, we cannot fall in the habit of attributing unbiblical characteristics to the Holy Spirit and calling it the work of the Spirit. We can't fall into that pattern. Jesus warns us against it. It's very dangerous. It's very dangerous. Now, we could go on and on and say more about this, but my point is not to point out every fallacy in this culture because we'd be here a long time. We'd be here a long time. My goal is to teach us the truth from this book. That's my goal. Teach us the truth from this book. Let's set aside what we think we know, what we've heard, what we think we've seen, and let's look at what the Word of God says about the work of the Spirit. But what's the problem? Why... 
why do we why do we allow people to tell us that these are the works of the Spirit? What's the problem? Well, I think it really comes down to this. Maybe the real work of the Holy Spirit isn't exciting enough for some people. We, we want to see God move in great ways, don't we? We want to see big, miraculous signs. I mean, we, we, we'll go to the store. I've seen people that's almost this bad, and they'll pick up roast beef and ham and say, Lord, which one should I buy? Seriously, I have seen people that is that, that, that they have taken spiritualism to that level. And if the ham, I don't know, uh, they get a sensation in their left hand with the ham, they'll buy the ham. That's a sign from God to buy the ham. Church, that is foolishness. But that is where it eventually goes to and gets to. Because we want fireworks in our lives. We want miracles. We want displays of God's power. We want that. We want that. We want divine intervention in nearly every aspect of our lives. And I think if we're probably uh, realistic and honest with ourselves, probably most of us have fallen into that pattern. Lord, I need uh, divine revelation. I need uh, uh, this divine um, intervention over the smallest, most mundane tasks of life. We want God to give us a fresh word. We want to feel like God is with us. And so many times we make up these visions or perhaps this idea that God has spoken specifically to us. You see, we want God's power so desperately that we seek a sign. It reminds me of a scripture verse from Matthew 16, verse 4. Jesus says, an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. A sign will not be given except the sign of Jonah. And he left them and went away. Well, what's the sign of Jonah? That Christ would die and raise again, church. If you need more of a sign that God is alive in your life and God has the power to save you than the sign of Jonah, which is the resurrection of Jesus Christ, God says you're not going to get it. You evil and wicked generation, I've given you all the proof you would ever need that I am God. Why are you still seeking a sign? So church, I want to get into the meat of our message this morning. I want to assure you, I want to assure you that the work of the Holy Spirit is incredibly powerful. It is far more powerful, far more powerful than falling on the ground and barking. Far more powerful. And so let's look at the Word of God together this morning. What does the Word of God tell us is the work of the Holy Spirit? Because you know what, church? That's what I'm interested in. And I hope you are as well. I hope you are as well. The first work of the Holy Spirit is this. It should be up on the screen. Salvation. Regeneration. That is the first work of the Holy Spirit. Let's, let's look at Titus chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. These two will be up on the screen. I will, uh, I'll have a few verses per uh, point. And then we will also read a selection together coming up soon. But Titus 3, 5 through 6, what does that say? He saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. That's what the Bible teaches us is the work of the Spirit, church, regeneration, the renewing, the quickening to life of a dead and dying soul back to life. Church, that is the most amazing work in the history of the world. I think that work is far more incredible than even the creation of the world itself. That God could take a dead, dying, wicked man or woman and bring them back to life. Raise them as, as in the valley of dry bones. That is an amazing work, church. Salvation and regeneration. Let's look at John 6, 63. It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and are life. It's the spirit, church, who brings life, regeneration to our souls. Scripture is very clear about that. Now, in each of these, I have only picked two scripture verses that prove these points. There are far more. There are many, many more. And I want to say that again. The most amazing and powerful work in all in human history is the fact that Jesus Christ, through the power of the Holy Spirit, can raise a wicked sinner to life. To replace our dead, dying heart with the heart of Christ. Brothers and sisters, we don't need to invent ways in which the Spirit works in a powerful way. All we have to do is trust the Word of God and believe it. Because the work of the Spirit is amazing. To regenerate the dead, cold heart of an unbeliever, to transform them into the new life of Christ, that is what the Bible teaches. That is not my opinion. 
Okay? That is not my experience that I had one time. That is the teaching of God's word. And so the first work is salvation. Jesus Christ sent, or God the Father sent the Spirit to testify to salvation of Jesus Christ. So that's number one. Number two, let's move on because we've got a lot to cover. Conviction. Second work of the Holy Spirit in this world is to convict the world of sin. Again, not my opinion, church, and we're going to look at uh, at least one verse here in a moment. And you might think that I should have pointed out conviction before regeneration. I don't believe that's the teaching of Scripture. Uh, how can a dead person, somebody who's dead in their sins, walking in darkness, be convicted of anything? I believe quickening, regeneration happens first, and then conviction after that. But the Bible tells us that conviction, the Holy Spirit was sent to convict the world of sin. Let's look at John 16, 8 real quick together. And this is Jesus speaking. And he, when he comes, this is the Holy Spirit, capital H, this is Jesus speaking. And he, the Holy Spirit, when he comes, will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. So again, Jesus himself tells us the work of the Spirit, doesn't he? He tells us the Spirit will come to convict the world of sin. And he doesn't just convict the, 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 the world that's been, that, that has been uh, regenerated at that one point of their sin. He convicts Christians who have been walking with the Lord a long time of their sin as well. The Holy Spirit is a continuing work of conviction in our lives. I've shared the story many times, uh, probably with you, maybe privately, even from the pulpit, I think. But I remember one time I was in a prayer meeting and we were confessing our sins out loud to one another and got to this, this little old lady who had to be in her 80s and she was just broken before the Lord and she, she said, you guys, I need to confess. I've been eating too many potato chips lately. I have been relying on those potato chips to find comfort for my soul and I've been gluttonous with potato chips. And here I am thinking, oh geez, I'm gonna get to me and I'm gonna sound like a, like a murderer or something when I, convict, when I share my sins. If she's convicted of potato chips, my sin's way worse. But it wasn't. It was her sin, and the Holy Spirit was convicting her of that sin. She was just further along in her sanctification, which we'll get to next, than I was. So church, the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin. Every one of us, when you do something that you shouldn't be doing, the Holy Spirit speaks to us, convicts us, so that we will continue in repentance, is what Scripture tells us to, to grow in our repentance. And again, brothers and sisters, this is the truthful teaching of God's word. This is not sensationalism. This is not my opinion. When he comes, the Holy Spirit will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness. That's the second work of the Holy Spirit, church. Let's move on. The third work of the Holy Spirit, which I just alluded to, sanctification. Okay? The Spirit regenerates, quickens us to spiritual life, convicts us of sin, which leads to repentance, and next, he sanctifies us. He cleanses us. He conforms us more and more into the image of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's look at Romans 8, 13, very quickly together. Romans 8, 13. For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. There's sanctification, church, putting to death the deeds of the flesh. Putting to death the deeds of the flesh. Let's look at 1 Peter 1, 1 and 2. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who reside as aliens, scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father by the sanctifying work of the Spirit to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood. May grace and peace be yours in the fullest measure. Church, the Holy Spirit works in our hearts, excuse me, in our minds. He works in our tongues, our actions, with the goal to transform you into the image of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That is sanctification, to clean the tarnished, rough, dirty areas of your life in order to make you into a new creation, to set you apart as holy unto God. Church, talk about a powerful work of the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit could take a dirty sinner like me and transform me into the glorious image of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You want a powerful work, church? There's one for you. The God, the God who, who saved us through the cross also sent us the Holy Spirit to complete that work. That is power, church. You don't need to look for ways in which the Holy Spirit is powerful. There is a biblical way the Holy Spirit is powerful. So that's the next one. Let's move on. 
We have salvation and regeneration, conviction, sanctification. The Holy Spirit leads us to truth. Let's open up our Bibles together to 1 Corinthians 2. And we're going to read verses 9 through 16 together. You could actually read right into the beginning of uh, chapter 3. And, 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 uh, but we're going to stop at 16 this morning. So 2, 9 through 16. And then I'm going to read this. Follow along with me. I'll give you a few minutes to get there. The Holy Spirit leads us to truth. 1 Corinthians 2, verses 9 through 16. It says this, but just as it is written, things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard and which have not entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. For to us, God revealed them through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of man except the Spirit of the man, which is in him? Even so, the thoughts of God no one knows except the Spirit of God. Now we have received, not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit of who is from God, that we might know the things freely given to us by God, which things we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them, because they are spiritually appraised. But he who is spiritual appraises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no man. For who has known the mind of the Lord, that he should instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Why do we have the mind of Christ? Because we have the Spirit of God within us, who teaches us and reveals what to us, church? This! The Spirit of God illuminates the Word of God so that we might understand it. The natural man cannot understand this. How many of us have seen that in action before? Somebody who is not a follower of Christ, this is gibberish to them. This means nothing to them. Those who are quickened to life by the Spirit, regenerated, and being sanctified through the work of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit also illuminates the truth of this to them. The Holy Spirit bears as a testimony, gives a testimony to the truth of God's Word. That's what this is telling us. It is a powerful, powerful work of God. You see, the Holy Spirit isn't, uh, isn't uh, appraising and testifying to the things that we think of in our mind that we just decide we want to believe one day. No. For those of us who are truly walking in the Spirit, He is quickening us to life, so to speak, so that we may know what is in here and understand it. The truth of God's Word, the truth of this book. It illuminates for us. It draws back the curtain of the truths of God and who God is so that we can see God in truth, not in falsehood. In John 16, Jesus says this. I don't believe this is up on the screen, but I'll read it. I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, it's capital S, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will disclose to you what is to come. He will glorify me, for he will make take of mine and will disclose it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said that he takes of mine and will disclose it to you. The Holy Spirit takes the knowledge of God and he discloses it to the people of God. That is the work of the Holy Spirit, church. Again, not my opinion. Not my opinion. The Word of God very clearly tells us this. And so another incredible work of the Spirit is that he guides us in wisdom and understanding. He illuminates the Scripture so that we might understand them. Why? So he can complete all his other works too. Sanctification, conviction. When we know this, we know God. If we do not know this, we do not know God. The God that we serve is a figment of our imagination if you do not know this book. And who reveals this book to us? But the Holy Spirit himself. Amen. Praise God for that. What's the next work of the Spirit? Let's look. He intercedes in prayer and comforts us in life. This is another amazing work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was given to believers to bring us comfort, to minister to us in times of difficulty, but also to pray on our behalf when we are too broken, to even, to even uh, let out a single word. Throughout the book of John, Jesus tells us that when uh, he departs, when Jesus departs, God will send the comforter to walk with us, to walk with us. 
in this life to strengthen us and to minister to us. That's an amazing thing. But not only this, the Holy Spirit intercedes on our half in prayer. Can you imagine? Can you imagine God himself intercedes on our behalf in prayer when we can't muster the words ourselves? Let's look at Romans 8, 26 very briefly together. In the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Church, that is an amazing truth that the Word of God teaches us. Not only does the Spirit bring us comfort in time of difficulty, but he prays on our behalf. Why? Because the Spirit of God knows what is best for us when we don't even know ourselves. I want to stop us for just a minute. We haven't even gotten through everything. But church, isn't the truth of the work of the Holy Spirit far better than sensationalism? Isn't it? Isn't the truth of what the Holy Spirit does far better than anything a man could ever invent? It is. We need to know it, church, and we need to trust it. And we need to put aside any foolishness that we might think is the work of the Holy Spirit. And I'm not accusing any of us of, of doing that this, this morning. I don't know what you think the work of the Holy Spirit is. But church, I know how I grew up and I know what I was told. And it does not match up. Everything does not match up with what this teaches. And so, I say praise God that, I, that, that when I am in need of the Spirit to comfort me, to guide me, to pray when I can't even pray myself. And I went through a lot of that last year. And any of you who have went through a time of great difficulty in your life know the importance of that promise. Comfort. And that the Holy Spirit will pray on your behalf. Intercede when your groanings can't even create a word. It's much more helpful, church, than falling on the floor in a trance. The actual work of the Holy Spirit is. Let's move on. The Holy Spirit also gives us, uh, emboldens us in the gospel. Embolden us, emboldens us to proclaim the gospel. Let's look at Acts 1.8. One of my favorites. Acts 1.8. Many of you may have this memorized like I do. It's a great one to memorize. But it says this. But you will receive power. When? When will you receive power? The Holy Spirit comes upon you. What will happen? You shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. Acts 1, 8. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, church, when we are quickened to life, when we are regenerated through salvation and the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be given boldness to be ambassadors and witnesses for Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. 1 Peter 1, 12. Let's look at the next one. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you, when they spoke of the things that they now have been told by you, um, by, told to you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Again, the gospel emboldens us, church. It gives us the truth that we might have the power to be compelled, perhaps, to speak it. It's another work of the Holy Spirit. Empowers us to proclaim the gospel. It is the Holy Spirit who compels us and encourages us, church, in gospel work. Strengthens us. It's the Holy Spirit who works salvation on earth. And this is important. The Holy Spirit is the one who works out salvation on earth. And so it is most logical that he would help us to accomplish that goal, right? The first thing we talked about, the Holy Spirit brings salvation, regeneration, and he also emboldens us to help in that task. It's an amazing thing, church. It is an amazing thing. So much more uh, incredible, so much better than the things we've been told, at least some of the things we've been told. Amen. The Holy Spirit himself helps us in the harvest. And let's look at the last one. The Holy Spirit seals us. Now, this one's very important. Let's look at Ephesians 1, 13 together. This will be on the screen. Ephesians 1, 13. Church, I don't know why, but every time I read this one, I can't read it because it is so amazing to me. In him, you also, after listening to the message of truth, again, the message of truth, which comes from the Spirit, the gospel of your salvation, which comes from the Spirit, having also believed, which comes from the Spirit, you are sealed 
by the Spirit. This is actually talking about the Spirit. First part of Ephesians, if you're not familiar, talks about God the Father, Jesus the, the Son, and then next, the Holy Spirit. This is the part on the Holy Spirit. You were sealed in Him with the Holy Spirit of promise. Church, oh man. I am so humbled by that verse that God loves me enough not just to give me all these wonderful things, but to seal me, to seal my salvation through his power, not my own. Do you, do you understand what he's teaching us here? That we are sealed for the day of redemption, the day of judgment, by the power of God and not by ourselves. Because church, if it was up to me, I would be destroyed on the day of judgment. But it's not up to me. It's up to Christ. It's up to the Holy Spirit. It's up to the Christ who, who died for me and the Holy Spirit who seals me. The Holy Spirit is the seal, church, that we belong to Christ. It is the reminder to God that we are his own possession. The Holy Spirit bears testimony to God that we are in Christ. And that is why, church, we have both hope for today and for eternity. It's because the Holy Spirit seals me. The Holy Spirit holds my eternity. I don't hold it myself. The Holy Spirit bears witness to the believer that Jesus Christ came, he suffered, he died, he rose, he paid for their sin, and the Holy Spirit also testifies to the believer that he will return again. Amen? How many people here this morning believe those things? Amen. You don't believe those things on your own. Do you understand that? You believe those things because the Holy Spirit has bared a witness to you. He bore a testimony of those things to you. That's why you believe those things. The darkened mind of a depraved man cannot believe those things without the help of the Spirit, church. Church, I want to tell you this morning that the work of the Holy Spirit is miraculous. If you're looking for fireworks, church, look no further than what we just looked at this morning. Talk about a miracle. Talk about the incredible, powerful move of God on this earth, the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, when I depart from you, don't worry. See, Jesus knew what was, what was best, right? He knew what was coming. Don't worry. I'm going to be gone, but guess what? God is sending someone, the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, to be with you to walk with you, to save you, to convict you, to sanctify you, to teach you and illuminate the scriptures to you, to seal you in your salvation, to bear a testimony of the things in which you have heard and believe, to give you understanding and wisdom and knowledge and brothers and sisters to give you hope and comfort even in times of great despair. And brothers and sisters, praise God for this last one. Praise God that the Holy Spirit is working every single one of us who are in Christ into the glorious image of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Sanctification. Praise God. You see, brothers and sisters, the work of the Holy Spirit is tangible. It is knowable. It is explainable and understandable. Do you understand that? The work of the Holy Spirit is explainable. It is not a mystery. It is not a mystery. And brothers and sisters, most importantly, the work of the Holy Spirit is always beneficial to the believer. Beneficial. The Holy Spirit is not, never going to work in a way which is not beneficial to the people of God. That is the Holy Spirit's entire mission, church, is to benefit us. The Spirit of God given to God's people to benefit us, to strengthen us. I say praise God. And church, that is why I felt we needed to talk about these things before we can even move on to what is walking in the Spirit versus walking in the flesh. If you're waiting on God and the Holy Spirit to do something in your life, but you don't know what you're waiting for, what is Hosea, what, what is Hosea, right? He says, my people were destroyed by what? Lack of knowledge. Church, we cannot have a lack of knowledge about the things of the Holy Spirit. We can't. Because the Holy Spirit is our lifeline as believers. We need to know why he's given to us. We need to understand the work that he's doing in our lives. And brothers and sisters, we need to give God the glory for that. We need to give God the glory for that. You may worship God first. You may fall on your knees in the, in the greatest difficulty and worship God like Job did. You may wait on the Lord, 
But if you, if you don't know the work of the Spirit Church, you'll be waiting uh, for something that you can't recognize. And I'm going to tell you this morning, if there's ever a time in your life where something arises and you're waiting for the Lord to give you new revelation about that situation, two things are going to happen. You're going to either be waiting until you die because he's not going to give you any new revelation. Everything we need to know is here. Or the second thing, which most usually happens, is you'll make something up. Oh, God spoke to me. I need to explain this. So I'm just going to pretend that God spoke to me. And you'll bear a fault, false witness on behalf of the Holy Spirit. Church, we need to be diligent. We need to be extremely careful. Just like with any great doctrine, right? Any great doctrine of this book. We need to be very careful with it. We need to know how to handle it. We need to know how, how to understand it. Because this book remains our only source of truth. And I know all of us believe that, but do we really believe that? When this book challenges the long-held truths that we have, do we throw those long-held truths out the window and, and, and trust the book? Or do we trust what we've heard? Brothers and sisters, in the past 100 years especially, the Holy Spirit has been accused of all sorts of ungodly things. I would say of all sorts of, of satanic things at times. All kinds of human things. But I hope you know, church, I hope you know that to understand the ministry of the Holy Spirit, you go to the source. Here. Can we at least agree on that? We go to the source. Brothers and sisters, I don't, can you go back one, Christopher? One more. You want to know the work of the Holy Spirit, church? They're going to fall in one of these categories. They're going to fall in one of these categories. This is the work the Holy Spirit is really doing on earth. His works will always point us to Christ and ultimately transform us into the image of him. Uh, the, the, the scripture verse uh, that just came to mind. Uh, where's it at? Um, from one level of glory to the next, as we gaze upon who? Christ. Remember that verse? Where's it at? Does anyone remember? Yeah, it's in, it's in Corinthians. Um, first or second? I think it might be second Corinthians. Is it first? Okay. Okay, battle of the preachers. <laughs> Someone can look that up after service. I say second, just because I want to be different. Okay. As we get one level of glory to the next, as we gaze upon Christ, church, that's the work of the Spirit. That's the work of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not a mystery, church. I praise God he's not. His works are not a mystery. I praise God they're not. However, the Holy Spirit may lead us on very different paths in life, right? That, I think, is where um, we need to spend some time. And we're not going to do that this week. We're going to do that next week. That's your teaser, okay? The Holy Spirit may take us on very different paths. And the Holy Spirit may give you very different spiritual giftings than me, right? So how do we discern that? That's like dangling the carrot out in front of you. Don't miss next week because that's what we'll talk about. Two? Two? I'm not going to gloat, especially from the pulpit. And so, brothers and sisters, as we begin to, to spend more time on this topic, as we, because we're going to be spending a lot of time here. I don't know how many weeks it will be yet, but the Lord will, I think, reveal that. I found there can be a lot of danger in planning out sermons, and this is what we're doing, period, end of story, moving on. That's the thing's very dangerous, so I haven't done that. I've literally walked into this almost with a, with a clean slate. Uh, I actually had it all planned out, and uh, actually, Brother Chris and I talked uh, at, at, at his kitchen table a couple weeks ago, and we talked about how that, God doesn't usually always work that way. <laughs> <laughs> he said, you think you're going this way? You know, God makes plans. I mean, we make plans and God laughs. Um, but I think next week we will be talking about that, church. How do we discern where God is teaching us, taking us, if our life paths are often different and our spiritual giftings are often different? That's what we'll talk about next week. But this week, I want to say just one last time, church, the Holy Spirit is here and given to us to help, to enrich us, to teach us, to walk with us in a very tangible and real way. You don't have to invent ways that the Spirit is working. Because, brothers and sisters, the Spirit is working in this world. Uh, another verse just came to me. Uh, the, the restrainer, I think it's in Galatians or Colossians, the, the restrainer is at work in this world, the Holy Spirit. Think of how bad this world would be if the Holy Spirit wasn't restraining the sin. It's going to get that bad 
uh, when, when, right before Christ returns, right? We know that. Uh, right after Christ returns in the seven-year tribulation, it's going to get that bad. The restrainer will be gone, and this world will go to hell in a handbasket, if I can use that frame, quickly. Out of that, that phrase. So church, let's just understand that. It's, the Holy Spirit is tangible. His work is real. And we can grow, we can benefit, and be edified by it. Let's pray.